Tonight's guest, as you can see, is appearing via video link. Uh, since being back in the UK, Peter has been a very active participant in the debate about this book, The Spirit Level, and that's what he is going to discuss tonight. Yeah, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, as Jessica said, the, uh, the uh, topic for this evening is this book, uh, The Spirit Level, by uh, Bridget Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. Uh, it was published in 2009 uh, in Britain and in the last two years here has had a huge impact, uh, not just on the chattering classes, but across the political spectrum. Uh, and most of the reception to the book has been uh, positive and, and pretty uncritical. Uh, and I want to suggest to you this evening, I, I produced a critique of this book last year, uh, and the CIS is going to be republishing that critique with a new uh, 9,000 word uh, postscript uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and it's on the basis of that postscript that I want to uh, talk this evening about the problems with this book. So, Jess, if we can go to, straight away to the first slide. Um, the, the book's claim is a very simple one. It's that uh, once a, a society reaches uh, a reasonable level of development and affluence, uh, continued growth uh, doesn't make people any happier and doesn't make the society any better. And what matters from then on is not the amount of wealth that the society is creating, but its distribution. Uh, so the basic claim in the book uh, is that the more unequal uh, a country is, uh, the less happy its people are, uh, and the less successful it is as a functioning society. Uh, click on the next point. Um, they show this through a whole series of graphs um, with uh, inequality, uh, income inequality plotted on one axis and then all sorts of different indicators plotted on uh, the vertical axis, uh, including uh, whether people trust each other, uh, level of health in the, uh, in the population, infant mortality, life expectancy, um, education, uh, literacy, numeracy levels, uh, family strength, uh, community strength, uh, levels of criminality, um, violence, uh, uh, playground, uh, bullying, uh, all of these things uh, they show through their graphs appear to be worse uh, in the more unequal countries and better in the more equal countries. Next point. What's particularly impressive about the book on first reading is that they not only show this, uh, this pattern uh, in, in international comparisons, but they show it again by looking at the 50 American states. So in a sense, they've got two different samples. They've got a sample of countries and a sample of the American states. And again, what they show for the American states is the same thing. The more unequal states appear to have the bigger problems. Next point. The explanation that's offered uh, is that human beings basically evolved in um, sort of uh, primitive hunter-gatherer bands where it was important to share everything. Uh, these bands were non-hierarchical, so we are, in a sense, genetically hardwired uh, to be sharing and egalitarian, and finding ourselves for the last few thousand years in hierarchical uh, societies, in, in, in uh, dominance hierarchies, as Wilkinson calls them. Um, causes us stress, uh, which comes out in all sorts of ways in terms of lower life expectancy and so on, uh, and also produces violence and aggression and hostility and egoism and so on uh, in our relations to other people. Uh, hence the quote, a less unequal society causes dramatically lower rates of ill health and social problems because it provides us with a better fitting shoe. Equality uh, is what we are naturally predisposed towards. Inequality is unnatural for us. And it follows from all of this, the policy that follows from all of this is that uh, once we've reached this certain level of development, as we have done in the West, uh, we would all benefit from income distribution. This is the real kicker in the book. It's not just that the poor need more money, it's that everybody would be better off uh, if we uh, flattened the income distribution. So if anybody's sitting there tonight with a few dollars uh, tucked away in the bank, you really would be happier, according to Richard Wilkinson, if the government took it away from you and redistributed it. Everybody would feel better off, the society would improve. Next slide. Now, the argument about uh, equality versus inequality has been going on, of course, for hundreds of years. And basically, it's, it's, it's an ethical argument. It's a moral argument. And there's two very strong moral principles combating each other uh, in this discussion. Uh, 
uh, on the one hand, there's the argument that it is morally wrong for some people to have a lot when other people have very little, uh, which is, of course, the left-wing position. Against that is the equally strong moral argument that it is morally wrong to take money away from people uh, if they have uh, come about it through their own efforts and through honest endeavour and so on. It's wrong to engineer society uh, and, and take away what people have, uh, have legitimately acquired. And those two ethical principles just battle at each other for hundreds of years. What this book's doing is saying, actually, we can go beyond the ethics. We can now establish for the first time there is a scientific, empirical, factual basis to the claim that societies should be more equal. It's not simply an ethical claim, it's a scientific claim. The reason I put the little picture of Marx and Engels up there, along with uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, is, of course, this is exactly what Marx, and Marx uh, claimed uh, back in the 19th century. He said uh, that the ethical argument for socialism was one that he was leaving behind. He was establishing socialism on a scientific basis, and that was why Marxism had the impact that it did on, on uh, intellectual thinking. Uh, Wilkinson is making the same pitch here in the 21st century. Um, the advantage of the growing body of evidence, the harm inflicted by inequality is that it turns what purely personal intuitions into publicly demonstrable facts. This will substantially increase the confidence of those who have always shared these values and encourage them to take action. So again, like Marx, this is a call to action. It's not just an idle theory. Next slide. And it's a call to action that all the usual suspects have rallied to. Um, this book has been praised across the political spectrum in Britain from, uh, from the, uh, the centre right. I mean, Cameron is a big fan, uh, right the way through to the hard left. And uh, I understand I was talking to Jess earlier and she said that uh, Philip Blonde, uh, the advocate of, uh, of red conservatism, was addressing the Menzies Centre on Monday. Blonde again referred to this book in very positive terms. But of course, the real fans of this book are on the left. The Guardian uh, thinks it's wonderful. The Independent, which in some ways is a more left-wing newspaper than The Guardian, uh, The Independent said free marketeers should be forced to memorize it cover to cover, which would be a huge punishment. Um, uh, Roy Hattersley, who was the deputy leader of the Labour Party, summed, it up, summed up many people's reactions on the left in this New Statesman review where he said that the book demonstrates the scientific truth of the assertion that social democrats have made for a hundred years uh, that all of us, irrespective of income, have much to gain from the creation of a more equal society. And uh, finally, there's Polly Toynbee. I went to a, um, a, a, a seminar on, on this book uh, in London about this time last year. Uh, with Polly Toynbee was on the panel. Polly Toynbee is the great sort of um, a darling of the Guardian Easters. Uh, in Britain. Uh, and Polly really went overboard on this and she said that, uh, that Richard Wilkinson was, was the new Charles Darwin, uh, that what Wilkinson had done was the equivalent of what Darwin had done, that, it, that, 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 that his discovery of the link between inequality uh, and social and personal uh, unhappiness is a eureka moment uh, that ranks in science with, the, uh, with Darwin's discovery of the law of evolution. Again, very interesting all this stuff because actually if you go and read what Engels said at Marx's grave in 1883, Engels said exactly the same thing about Marx. He said Engels had, uh, had, was the, 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 uh, the equivalent of Darwin uh, for the social sciences. Polly Toynbee saying the same thing about Richard Wilkinson. Uh, they, they really have gone overboard on this stuff. Uh, next slide. Now, what I say in the, uh, the CIS edition of, of my critique is I've sort of boiled down the... Uh, uh, the, the problems in this book uh, to five key ones, uh, none of which seem to be addressed by all these people who, who, who think the book is so wonderful. Uh, and the five key problems, which I'll go through with you now this evening, are firstly the uh, bias in the selection of countries that they look at. Secondly, the bias in the indicators that they look at, uh, the, the indicators of well-being and, and functioning societies. Uh, they pick some, they ignore others. Uh, thirdly, that the evidence in the book doesn't actually uh, establish the case for the theory that is put forward in the book. Fourthly, and uh, something that I've spent a lot of time on, which, which in, in a way is pivotal, uh, the statistical analysis in the book uh, doesn't stand up. Uh, there, there's, it, it, it's full of spurious correlations. Uh, and finally, uh, there's actually a much stronger explanation for the patterns that Wilkinson is interested in, and it's an explanation which he ignores.
So we'll simply go through those five points and take the next slide. Start with the first problem, which is the what I call selection bias, the, uh, the, the, the selection of the countries that they look at. Now, just look at the quote there in italics, which uh, is the, what the book says they did. Uh, we obtained a list of the 50 richest countries in the world from the World Bank. We excluded those with populations below 3 million because we didn't want to include tax havens. And we excluded countries without comparable data on income inequality. This left us with 23 rich countries. So 23 out of 50, what, why were the other 27 dropped? Well, if you go back to the World Bank stuff, what you find is six of the 50 richest uh, which were dropped uh, were small countries, but they were not tax havens. These are countries with populations between one and three million that could have been included. Uh, I mean, the thesis ought to stand up for small countries as well as large ones. None of those are tax havens, Slovenia, Trinidad, Estonia, Latvia, and so on. They're not tax havens. So they could have been included. More particularly, 18 of the countries have populations over 3 million, so they met Wilkinson's threshold uh, of population size. They don't get included in their sample, and for the life of me, I don't understand why, because when you go back to the World Bank, all 18 uh, have plentiful data on income distribution and all the other indicators that they're interested in. So why on earth aren't these countries included? Next slide. What you see is those that are included are overwhelmingly Western European countries. 16 out of the 23 uh, are Western European countries, uh, plus the US and Canada, uh, two from Asia, uh, Singapore and Japan, uh, two from Oceania, Australia and New Zealand, and Israel. So who's been left out? Well, overwhelmingly, it's the Eastern European countries that have been left out. Uh, these are countries that uh, very often uh, under the Soviet uh, control um, which quite often have quite flat income distributions, but also have a lot of social problems. There's also three more countries in Asia, three in Africa, three in South America, five in Central America and the Caribbean, all of which could have been included. We've got the data on those countries, but they were excluded. Next slide. I debated this book with Wilkinson and Pickett, um, again about this time last year at a, at a, a conference organised by the Royal Society of Arts in London. Uh, and they jumped on me on, on, on this issue and said, uh, Saunders doesn't understand, uh, our thesis only applies to affluent countries, to countries that have reached a certain level of development, and he wants to include all these poor countries. It's, it's a completely illegitimate response to what I'm saying, because they, it, it's not me who says we should take the 50 richest countries, it's them who said that they should take the richest 50, and yet they've dropped 27 of them. Most of the countries they dropped are at the poorer end of that 50, but they themselves say in their book, if we had included poorer countries, it would have made little difference to our results. Greater equality is beneficial at all levels of economic development. And anyway, four of the countries that they dropped are actually richer than Portugal, which they include. So there's no strong, good, clear reason why they didn't go with what they said they were going with, which is the 50 richest countries in the world, and why they've ended up with only 23. And of course, the result of that is that uh, the countries that uh, get omitted tend to be one of two kinds. Either they're countries which have quite flat income distributions, but a lot of social problems, such as many in Eastern Europe, Czech Republic, I'll give us one example, or they're countries that actually score very well on all their indicators of well-being, uh, but which have quite uh, high income inequality, of which South Korea uh, is a good example. What, where is South Korea in this list of countries? It's, it's, it's a big country, 50 million population. The GDP per head is, is above that of Portugal. Why isn't it included? Why aren't countries like that in there? And I think the reason I would suggest is that they would have undermined and destroyed many of the graphs and patterns uh, that Wilkinson and Pickett uh, claim to find. Uh, next slide should now be on slide nine. The second problem is not just that they're selective in the countries uh, that they uh, look at, they're also selective in the indicators, the measures that they take of whether a country is a good place to be or not. So for example, uh, they take uh, uh, drug use, uh, and they show the more unequal countries, the higher the level of drug use, uh, but they're silent on alcohol consumption. And when you look at alcohol consumption figures, you find that actually the alcohol 
uh, runs the opposite direction to the drug use. It's more equal countries that have higher alcohol problems. Uh, they look at it, this one's really odd. They look at imprisonment rates, but they don't look at crime rates. And again, go and fish out the data on crime. And what you find is there's actually no association between crime rates and inequality. In, the more unequal countries appear to imprison more of their criminals, but they don't have more criminals. So therefore, the book doesn't say anything about crime rates, so it only talks about imprisonment rates. They talk about homicides, but not suicides. Uh, on family measures, they talk about teenage births, but they don't talk about things like divorce rates. Again, because suicides are higher in more equal countries. Divorce rates are higher in more equal countries. Uh, on all this, the book is silent. They say that more equal countries uh, produce a more generous spirit. And the measure they take for that is government foreign aid. Now, I'd have thought the obvious measure to take of generosity of spirit is the level of charitable donations by individuals. If you look at the data on charitable donations by individuals, you find it's the most unequal countries that make the biggest donations. There isn't a word about that in the book. They, they're very interested in this concept of social capital, the idea of social cohesion, of community strength. The measure they take of that is uh, a survey, an international survey, which asks people, do you trust your neighbours? and which found that in the more equal countries, they apparently trust their neighbours more. But one of the best indicators of social capital isn't asking people whether they trust their neighbours, it's looking at whether people get involved in their local communities. And if you look at the data on membership of voluntary organisations, for example, again, it's in the most unequal countries that voluntary activity is highest. So what we've got here is a series of indicators which appear to support their thesis uh, and uh, conspicuous uh, ignoring of a series of other alternative indicators which would go against it. Next slide, slide 10. Um, what I've shown, <laughs> what I do in, in my critique um, for a bit of fun, uh, is I construct what I call a social misery index, which is, uh, consists of six indicators. Um, uh, answers on, on a question about racial bigotry, whether you mind if your neighbour is of a different race, um, the suicide rate, the divorce rate, uh, whether people have stopped having children, um, alcohol consumption figures and HIV infection rates. And put all that lot together into a single index uh, and run that against income inequality uh, on the 50 countries, uh, which is what that graph shows on the right of the slide. And lo and behold, you find a really nice, uh, statistically significant and quite strong association showing that the more uh, unequal the country uh, the less miserable it is. Um, those figures up there, and I will just explain them um, because we'll encounter these later in the talk. That little p is less than 0.001 is the significance level. What we're looking for on any uh, patterns of association is a significance level lower than uh, 0.05. In other words, uh, there's a probability of less than 5 in 100 that this could have appeared uh, by chance if there weren't really an association between the two, uh, the two variables. So this is uh, statistically uh, very significant. And that R square figure of 0.39 tells you uh, that 39% of the variance uh, in uh, the uh, dependent variables explained by the independent variables. So 39% of the variance in misery uh, is produced by, uh, in, by uh, equality, income equality. Um, now the point about this exercise, I don't think that more unequal, that more equal countries are more miserable. I don't think there's an association at all. Uh, but the point is, as I've said there, the, 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 the reference to Karl Popper, what, what we're supposed to do in social science is to develop hypotheses and then go out and try and test them by finding disconfirming instances. That's not what this book has done. What this book has done is come up with this hypothesis and then gone out to find confirming instances. Well, you can always find confirming instances for almost any theory you care to dream up. The, the real test is, does it stand up to disconfirming instances? Uh, the, the, the authors of this book uh, never even asked. They don't, they're not interested in that. Next slide. The third problem is that the theory in the book doesn't relate to the evidence. The theory, you'll remember, is that uh, human beings are very unhappy uh, in uh, dominance hierarchies in status pecking orders uh, and the more hierarchical a society the less happy we're going to be but the problem is that their evidence doesn't look at status hierarchies their evidence looks at income distribution next slide 
sociologists <laughs> are fairly useless creatures, but one of the helpful things that we have contributed over the last hundred years is a recognition that income inequality is not the same as status hierarchy, and Japan is a very good example of it. The two quotes on the right of this slide are from two major uh, texts on modern Japanese society, and I won't read them, but both of them are basically saying Japan is an unusually status-conscious, hierarchical society. Now, what's interesting, though, is that on their data, on Wilkinson's data, Japan comes out as the most equal, the most equal of the 23 countries in their sample. So Japan comes out on their measure as a very equal society when actually it's an incredibly hierarchical society, an incredibly status-oriented society. As anybody would know who's done business or uh, uh, had academic dealings in Japan. Um, now, the, the spirit level says that, quote, social status is one of the most important markers of psychosocial stress in modern societies. The book, the whole book stands on this claim that, that it's, uh, it's when we suffer in status hierarchies that we get the problems. Japan is, the, is one of the most status conscious hierarchical societies in their whole sample. So why, next slide, isn't Japan coming out at the other end of all their graphs? Japan scores really well on almost all of their indicators of well-being. And they've got Japan as their most equal society. So Japan is carrying a lot of the explanatory weight in this book. And yet, if you take their hypothesis seriously, Japan ought to be an absolute head case of a society. Um, I'm not the only one who said this. I mean, I've got the quote there from John Goldthorpe, who's an old adversary of mine in uh, British sociology. But in this particular case, he and I actually agree. Wilkinson and Pickett's inadequate one-dimensional understanding of social stratification leads to major problems in their account. That They think that income distribution, income inequality, is the same as status hierarchy, and it isn't. Now, while I'm on Japan, if we can just click and get the bottom half of that graph, that slide, I will just note in passing that anyway, Japan isn't as equal on income distribution as they claim it is, that they use World Bank data on the income distribution in different countries. The World Bank data exclude the self-employed, farmers and single-person households. If you look at the OECD data on income distribution in the 30 richest countries in the world, what you find is that Japan actually ranks 13th most unequal out of the 30. So Wilkinson and Pickett are using in, uh, incomplete World Bank data, which show that Japan is apparently very equal, and they need to show that because Japan scores so well on all of these indicators, uh, when actually if they'd used OECD data, it would have destroyed many of their graphs. Japan would have been uh, in the wrong end uh, of the graph. Next slide, Jess. Fourthly, uh, we've got the problem of the statistical analysis in this book, and there's, there's, it, it's two problems. Uh, the first is what statisticians call outliers, or if you like, it, it's the problem that, that they've allowed one or two extreme cases to skew their whole results. Um, and the best example of this is their international data on murder rates, homicide rates. So what we've got there is their graph of homicide rates plotted against uh, the inequality, uh, inequality along the bottom uh, of the graph, homicide rate up the vertical axis uh, for the 23 countries in their sample. Now, what you'll see like, with the little blue star is that one of those countries really stands out from all the rest, and that's the USA. Uh, the US has uh, a homicide rate three, four times higher than any of the other countries. All the other countries appear to have homicide rates that are actually quite similar. The US is way out of line. Uh, and whether that's because of uh, US gun control laws or some other factor, I don't know. The trouble is that by including the US along with the other 22, the other 22 countries, when you then fit your best fitting straight line to plot through those countries, it pulls the right hand side of that line upwards. Uh, and you end up with an apparent association, so it's statistically significant, it's below the 0.05, uh, and the R square is 0.22. So what they say, what, what we appear to have here is a graph showing that uh, income inequality explains 22% of the variance in homicide rates. And what 
that then leads them to, I mean, one of the most extraordinary quotes in the whole book is this one that I've, I've, I've put at the top there in italics. If Britain became as equal as Scandinavia, its homicide rate would fall by 75%. But actually look where Britain is on that graph. It's the right-hand blue arrow uh, next door to Australia, actually. And look where the Scandinavian countries are, left-hand blue arrow. I mean, Britain's homicide rate is actually lower than Sweden's. And yet the book says if Britain became more like Sweden, it would cut its homicide rate by 75%. Now, this is getting absurd. And the reason that they say that is that they are not looking at where Britain and Sweden actually are on that graph. They're looking at the straight line that they've drawn through the points. And they're assuming that Britain is therefore much higher up on that straight line and Sweden is much lower down on that straight line. If you click onto the next slide, if you take the US out, we lose that association. Look at that uh, significance level now, 0.159, way above the 0, uh, 0.05 uh, threshold cutoff. That is not a statistically significant association. Uh, you shouldn't even be drawing a straight line through it. There is no association between those variables on 22 of the countries. The only reason they get an association is because they include the USA, which for its own unique reasons has a very high homicide rate. There is no association between homicide rates and inequality in those countries. All there is is the US has a high homicide rate and everybody else doesn't. Next graph. You don't just find this on homicide rates, you find it throughout the book. So childhood obesity, for example, there we are again. The Americans have fat children. There they are, way up top right of the quadrant, big blue star. That's what's pulling the line up. That's what's giving them a significant association. Take America out, look at the other 22. There's no association. You lose the statistical significance. There is nothing to write a book about. You need America in there in order to say that inequality is doing anything. Next. Same with life expectancy, only this time it's not America that's the outlier, it's Japan. Blue star, top left quadrant. We all know that Japan has a very high life expectancy compared with most other countries. Some people think it's because they eat a lot of oily fish. I don't know whether that's true or not. But take Japan out, there's something distinctive about Japan and life expectancy. It may be, it may be genes, I don't know what it is. But take Japan out, there's no association, no statistical significance, nothing to write about. Next graph. <clears throat> so that's one of the problems, is that these extreme cases very often are giving you an apparent association where there isn't one. The second problem with the statistics is that they ignore the possibility that there is a third variable that is causing the apparent association between their two variables. Again, homicide is a very good example of this. Only this time we're looking at the graph of homicide rates in the 50 American states. Now again, familiar pattern, the line is going upwards from left to right, suggesting that as the states become more unequal, so the homicide rate is higher. So the states over in the top right quadrant have higher homicide rates and are more unequal than the states in the bottom left quadrant. If you, I don't know if you can make out what those states are on the screen, but what strikes you when you look at that graph is that many of the states in the top right quadrant are in the deep south. It's Mississippi, Missouri, Kansas, all, that, all those states, Alabama. Um, so the obvious question is, well, is this to do with inequality or is it something to do with the deep south states? And in particular, the fact that the deep south states have a different ethnic composition than, say, the northeastern states or the midwestern states. Next slide. Certainly, if you look at, if you plot homicide rate in the American states against their ethnic composition, the proportion of those uh, of the population that's African American, then you actually get a much stronger association than the one that Pickett and uh, Wilkinson uh, give you. If you look at that graph, that's significant, the same as the graph on the left. But look at the R square value, 0.57 compared with 0.69. It's twice as powerful. Ethnicity is twice as powerful in explaining the homicide rate, in predicting a state's homicide rate, uh, than income inequality is. Now, I, I won't bore you with the uh, technology of multivariate regression, but, but there's a very straightforward statistical procedure you can do where you put several different variables into an equation and you see which of them is more important than which other. So if you 
construct a, an equation that says, okay, I want to predict the homicide rate in the American states. And I will tell you three bits of information about each state. I'll tell you uh, its uh, ethnic composition. I'll tell you if it's in the deep south or not. And I'll tell you its income distribution. What you find is that all you need to know is the ethnicity. What that model shows is that ethnicity is about three times more powerful uh, than uh, income inequality in predicting uh, the uh, um, uh, homicide rate uh, in any state. If we move on, slide 19, you can see this even more clearly if we look at another one of their indicators, which is infant mortality. Again, the graph on the left is the infant mortality of the 50 American states uh, against their income distribution. Again, it appears that the more unequal states have a worse in, in infant uh, mortality rate. Graph on the right looks at the infant mortality rate of states uh, uh, predicted by their ethnic composition. And again, what you find is that it's much, much stronger predictor. Look at the R squared again. The R squared, 0.54, as against 0.14. It's about four times more powerful. If you want to predict what the infant mortality rate is in any American state, uh, and I tell you what its ethnic composition is, that will allow you to make a prediction four times better, four times more accurate uh, than if I tell you its income distribution. And again, the multivariate analysis on that, uh, there's the, uh, the uh, proportion of the variance explained by the uh, different variables. And you see that it's ethnicity that's driving this. Uh, it's nothing. The, 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 the little bar that's almost disappeared on the, the right of the bar chart uh, is, uh, is the contribution being made by income inequality. It's not statistically significant. It's not there. Infant mortality is not being driven by income distribution in the American states. It's being driven, it would seem, by ethnicity. Next slide. And the final problem. Had this book simply said, look, uh, the Scandinavian countries um, do quite well on a number of indicators that the Anglo countries appear to do quite badly on, uh, nobody would have shrugged uh, a shoulder. Uh, we've known that for donkey's years. Um, but the book doesn't say that. What the book says is countries do better the more equal their income distribution is. And the Scandinavians, of course, and Japan, according to their data, have the most equal income distribution. Now, there's a different explanation for why the Scandinavians appear at one end of these graphs and the Brits and the Americans and the Australians appear at the other. Uh, and it's cultural and historical. And it's nothing to do with their income distribution. It's factors. I, actually, the very first article I ever wrote for CIS was in Policy Magazine in 2001. It was called uh, Australia is not Sweden. Uh, and it was on all of this. And, it, and, and it's so important to understand the cultural dimension of these, of these differences. Uh, the Swedes, uh, the Scandinavians in general, and Japan, late developers, as against the early development uh, of uh, England, uh, the Early Demise of Feudalism, wonderful book by McFarlane about how basically feudal ties have disappeared in England as early as the 13th century. He describes England as a remarkably individualistic country as early as the 13th century. Um, the strong folk tradition in the Scandinavian and Japanese countries with a really strong sense of national and collective identity uh, as against much weaker uh, family bonds and much stronger individualistic values in uh, the Anglo countries. And most important of all, the ethnic homogeneity of the Scandinavians and Japan. That until recently, anyway, these were remarkably homogenous countries. And there's some very good work on all this. I've, um, a book by uh, Alice Cena, uh, for example. Um, uh, really good stuff that talks about the importance of um, cultural, ethnic, linguistic homogeneity in producing uh, in a country, a willingness to, for example, pay a lot of high taxes to support a very generous welfare system. Um, the Anglo countries, much more heterogeneous, much more open historically, uh, much more pluralistic, much more diverse, much more intermarriage for a much longer period. These, I believe, are the factors which explain the differences that uh, Wilkinson and Pickett are finding. They're cultural and historical differences, and they're nothing to do with the income distribution. Next slide. But how can I demonstrate that? Well, the obvious way to do it is to say, well, if you take out 
You see, if you think about it, they've got 23 countries. Four of them are the Nordic countries. Uh, five of them are Anglo countries. Nine out of their 23 countries are, the, are consisting of these two culture blocks. So what happens if you take those countries out? Do you still find this association between income distribution and social problems in the other countries? Leave aside the Scandinavians and the Anglos. What about the other countries? And Wilkinson and Pickett accept that this is a legitimate thing to do. The quote from the first edition of their book, although people have occasionally suggested that it's the English speaking countries which do badly, that doesn't explain much. Even if you delete them, there is still a close relationship. The same applies to the dominance of the Nordic countries at the other end of the distribution. So they're, they're inviting you to delete these countries and see if the relationship still stands up. According to them, it does. Get the next bit of the slide. Well, I've done that. In my critique published last year, I took out the Nordic countries and the Anglo countries and showed that nothing remains. There is no association with income distribution in the other countries in their sample. To which Wilkinson and Pickett then respond, Saunders tries to dismiss our evidence by variously excluding countries, arbitrarily cutting out certain countries. It's all about muddying the waters. Next slide. I'll give you some examples. I mean, they go on about uh, women's status being higher in more equal countries. Well, if you keep the Scandinavians in, you find a strong association. that They measure women's status in various ways I won't bore you with. Uh, take the Scandinavians out, no association. Next slide. Same with teenage births. Uh, if you take the Anglos and the Scandinavians out, what you're left with is not a lot of countries, but there ought to be an association there. There is no association. The association disappears when you take these cultural blocks out. So to summarise my findings about their findings, I've actually re-examined 20 of the correlations in their book. 14 of them are complete nonsense. Five of them, I find some support for an association with income distribution, but I find that there's other, th other variables that explain it better. Uh, I ended up in the first edition of my, of my book saying that there was one association which appeared to stand up, which was uh, the infant mortality rates uh, in different countries. And then I found uh, another critique came out around the same time as mine by uh, Christopher Snowden, uh, who uh, produced uh, some, some, some very interesting evidence on, on uh, why it is that infant mortality rates appear to vary between countries has nothing to do with income distribution. So even that one that I thought stood up doesn't. Coming towards the end, this book really is flawed. It's fundamentally, fatally flawed. I have gone on record as saying that if a graduate student gave me the kind of graphs that I see in this book, uh, I would fail them. Uh, I mean, it, it just flies in the face of the most basic statistical procedures. So what do you do if you're Wilkinson and Pickett and you've produced this book and you've got a lot of uh, left-wing adulation and you're being told that you're the new Charles Darwin uh, and you've set up an organisation called the Equality Trust and you're going around campaigning around the world for income distribution on the basis of your evidence. What do you do when I come along and one or two others have come along and say, actually, look, this just does not stand up? Well, what you do is three things. The first thing you do is that you stick negative labels on your opponents. So no sooner had my critique come out than The Guardian handed over uh, some space to Wilkinson uh, and they said uh, that I'd done a hatchet job by I was politically far right uh, and that I was racist, uh, which particularly, particularly uh, rankled. Um, yeah, they say that the, uh, the suggestion that the results in the U.S. states reflect the proportion of black people in each state is inaccurate and contains a seriously racist slur. Correcting our U.S. state analyses for the proportion of black inhabitants is racist. So I'm racist and I'm far right. Uh, and that, that, that kind of mudslinging has carried on ever since. Uh, and we, I and Snowden and one or two other critics, uh, then get contrasted by The Guardian with with the, uh, the soft, gentle and well-meaning uh, North Yorkshire uh, low-profile social scientists they're referring to, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, who've been subjected to a wave of brutal attacks by a posse of right-wing institutes staffed by professional wreckers of ideas. I actually wear that as a badge of pride. The Guardian has called me a professional wrecker of ideas. I put that on my website. 
Um, the, second, uh, the second thing you do, having stuck negative labels on people, you call them racists and fascists and so on, uh, is that you say that you represent the consensus. So uh, Pickett, for example, went on BBC Radio and she said, we wrote a book that's intended to be a synthesis of a vast body of research, not only our own, but those of other people. There's a consistent and robust and large body of evidence showing the same relationship. So what on earth is Saunders on about saying that this doesn't stand up? Uh, the whole of academia knows that this stands up. There's something odd about this claim because, because in the book and in various interviews, they also said that they were the first to find these associations. We couldn't believe anybody had, had not spotted them before. The picture we present hasn't been put together until now. Much of the data has only become available in recent years. So on the one hand, they're saying everybody agrees with this stuff, and uh, you know they, they, it's been produced by by hundreds of other academics. Uh, and then you say, and then they say, uh, but actually we're the only ones that were saying it. Um, but anyway, more importantly, Chris Snowden, and I do commend Snowden's book to you. It's a very good um, uh, critique called The Spirit Level Delusion. Um, Snowden, unlike me, had the patience to actually chase up all the references uh, that they give of all these people who apparently agree with them. And what he finds is that large numbers of these academics actually don't agree with them. Uh, it's, it's simply not true that there is a consensus where Wilkinson and Pickett claim there is. So that's the second thing you do is you say, uh, everybody agrees with us and Saunders must be mad. And the third thing you do when all that fails, when you try to call him a racist and you try to say that everybody agrees and, 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 and uh, that, that Saunders is on his own, uh, and still the argument goes on, what you finally do is you say, well, we're, we're just not going to talk about this anymore. Um, this uh, was in the Times Higher Educational Supplement, which is the um, sort of Bible of higher education in this country. The headline was Scholars Reject Further Debate with Ideologues. Uh, and no prizes for guessing who's the scholar and who's the ideologue. Um, and it's just an extraordinary article. Recent attacks from political groups led the authors of this to say that they'll no longer respond to any criticism that is not peer reviewed. They want to distinguish between well founded criticism and unsubstantiated claims made for political purposes. Wilkinson agreed that the move grated with the book's egalitarian ethos, but said it reflected their near total exhaustion. We would ideally have had research teams and an institute of staff to work with us, but we have absolutely no administrative support and have entirely lost our free time, he said. He insisted that recent attacks have been poorly researched and were intended merely to cast doubt on the spirit of those arguments in the public mind. So it goes on. They, I have been twice uh, asked to go on uh, Channel 4 here, the television uh, thing, and debate this book with them. Twice I've agreed, twice they've said no. Wilkinson and Pickett simply won't talk to me and they won't talk to uh, Chris Snowden anymore. And the reason that I call my critique Beware False Prophets is that it's a reference to dear old Max Weber, my favourite social, uh, sociologist from 100 years ago, in his essay, Science as a Vocation, who uh, Weber was, was really concerned to preserve the ethical realm against spurious claims of science. And I started off this talk by saying that the, the debate over inequality is really an ethical debate. And what Wilkinson's trying to do is to turn it into a factual scientific debate. And Weber is the one 100 years ago who really warned about this when he said, uh, who is to answer the question, what shall we do? How shall we arrange our lives? These great ethical questions. Only a prophet or savior can give those answers. If there's no such man, then you certainly will not compel him to appear on this earth by having thousands of professors as privileged hirelings of the state attempt as petty profits to take over his role. Uh, beware false profits. Now I'll stop. <laughs>